Well, if you would, take your Bibles, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to look at something that I believe that we have looked at before, but we're going to talk about the temptation of Jesus, and we're just going to uh, touch on a couple of things here as we look at this, but Matthew chapter 4, beginning with uh, verse 1 will be verses 1 through 11. And so we find uh, written there, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him into a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these things I will give you. If you fall down and worship me, then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. Behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for the opportunity to again freely gather and examine what you have to say to us tonight. We pray that you will help us to take what we see here, see how it applies to our lives the actions that we should take, I know that you will help us to take those actions. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we come to this, and first of all, to put it in context, anytime you see a verse that starts with then, it's kind of like we discussed with the men as we looked at Hebrews tonight. We discussed when you see one that starts with therefore, you look back and see what how it connects. When you see one that starts with then, you need to look back and see what just happened. Otherwise... You don't know what happened then. It's like coming into the middle of the story. Then. Well, what happened before this? Well, immediately before this, Jesus went and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And when he did this, the heavens were opened and the Spirit descended like a dove. And the voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And in that one incident, we see in that moment in time something that undoes the the idea that is bad theology that's called modalism that takes the Trinity where we see God revealing himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that tries to say, well, he was the Father at this time and then he was the Son and then he was the Holy Spirit because if he's, you know, he, because some folks want to try to make him where he's not all three at the same time. Well, he's all three at the same time. You see it there at the baptism of Jesus. That's important. It's actually one of the key, por key por portions of the narrative related to what we believe about God and how God reveals himself. And that happens there. And Jesus goes from that moment, which is his public entry into ministry, public entry into to where he is going out to, to set his face towards the work which God has called him to, is that moment at the river. And he's going from there. And so he goes, though, and he doesn't come out of the water and then go out and go straight into Jerusalem and go into healing people and raising the dead and preaching and teaching. And instead, he goes into the wilderness. He's led there by God through the Holy Spirit to go to the wilderness and be tempted. Matthew makes an important distinction, and it's the first thing that we need to remember. He's led there by the Spirit, but he's tempted by the devil. And we'll see this on Sunday mornings here coming up eventually, when we see that temptation does not come from God. God may send us things that, that, trip, that test us and try us, but the temptation comes from the enemy. It is never God's will that you should be tempted to the point that you stumble and fall. God does not will that you would sin. He does not send that temptation to you in the same way. In this case, Jesus is following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He's following God. He's doing what he's supposed to do. And yet he's still tempted by the devil. There are times 
that we run into temptation because we're doing things we're not supposed to do. David, we talked about him this morning, how he was up on the roof in the spring in the time when kings go off to war. David is at home on the roof of his palace and he looks and sees Bathsheba bathing off at, you know, at her home. And he's tempted. And one of the key lessons from that is if David had been off at war, because it was the spring and the time when kings are supposed to go off to war, that he never would have been tempted. And it's not uncommon that the reason that we're tempted is we're where we shouldn't be when we should not be there. I should not be at gun shows the day after I get paid. There becomes a temptation that leads to looking at my wife and saying, "Is there not a way that you can only that you can feed us for the next two weeks, based, two weeks based on the food that's already in the house?" It's just certain things I should not do. There are times and places that we shouldn't be to avoid temptation, but then there are times that we ought to be exactly where we are. Sometimes those places are places where folks say, wait a minute, why would you go there? There are people that will spend tonight on Bourbon Street in New Orleans, Louisiana, surrounded by people that probably passed from sober to intoxicated three hours ago and are on their way from that all over the cliff. But they're not there to get drunk and they're not there to party. They're there to be witnesses and ministers for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does that mean that they're gathering folks up and preaching? No, some of them. It means that they're trying to help drunk people not make dumb decisions. So that they live to make it another day to hear the gospel. Some of them, they're there because they're there to try to interrupt the cycle whereby women and children are, are abused and misused by people for their own pleasures. And they're in places we say, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of temptation there. They are. But they're there because they're led there and brought there by the Spirit of God to do the work of the kingdom of God. Sometimes as we do the things that we are supposed to do, as we do that which God has called us to do, we are still going to be tempted. You cannot live a life completely isolated from temptation. In fact, attempting to do so is falling into a different temptation. But you cannot wall yourself off. Across church history, there have been people that have tried to do this. There were those who went out into the desert in the early centuries of Christianity and they just wanted to get away from everything, all the decadence, all the wickedness of the Roman Empire, and they went farther and farther out into the desert to get away from the people. And yet people continued to follow them. And with people came the temptation. Some went out in the desert because they had begun to be famous as preachers. And so they went out into the desert because they didn't want to be tempted to have pride and people kept coming. Now folks, it's one sort of pride to be able to look out and say, wow, people come, sit in comfort. You know, sit in an air-conditioned or a heated building. Brand new pew cushions to listen to me preach. I cannot begin to imagine what it would do to my pride if y'all would follow me 30 miles out into the desert to listen to me preach. I think my pride would be worse. If y'all would walk that far and stand around that long. I know I wouldn't go that far to hear the preach. <laughs> we cannot avoid temptation. It comes. And it comes from the devil. And it doesn't mean that every time that you're tempted, it's actually the devil himself. We talked about this last week when we talked about the identity of our enemy, the fact that Satan is a powerful spiritual being, but he's not everywhere. Understand this. You can't be being tempted by the devil at the same time somebody else is being tempted by the devil, not personally. One of you is being tempted by somebody working for the devil. It may be part of his plan, and it may be something that you can blame him in the same way, for example, that you could look at all of the various portions of the United States federal government, and we've got a Department of Agriculture, and a Department of Commerce, and a Department of Education, and all those people work for the president. Let me hold this thought just a second. I'm not trying to make a connection between the president and the devil. It's just an example. 
Okay? Let's shift tracks. You have all these McDonald's in the world. <laughs> and there's a seat. I'm more comfortable making a connection between McDonald's and the devil than I am the president. Okay? Let's, because I don't want anybody to make that leap. You have all these McDonald's in the world. Every one of those drive through order takers, in a way, is working on behalf of the chairman of the board of the McDonald's Corporation. That doesn't mean every one of them is doing exactly what the chairman of the board of the McDonald's Corporation wants them to do. But every one of them is doing something on behalf of that chairman. Most of the temptation that you face is not made directly to you by Satan. It's made on behalf of him by somebody working for him, whether human or, or spiritual being. Or it's simply a temptation that comes because of the nature of this sin-soaked world that we live in. Those temptations come. <coughs> Jesus is tempted here by the devil. Why? Because when you have an important person, Jesus is the most important person ever set foot on this earth. You send your best possible tempter to try to take him down. And so Satan comes to try to do the job himself. <coughs> because Satan knows this. If he can derail Jesus from doing what he's, what he's come to earth to do, that he's come to be a propitiation for our sins, to pay for the cost of our sins, to appease the wrath of God and make us right with God. If he could derail that, that would be even a better victory than what he had in Eden when he convinced Adam and Eve that that, that one piece of fruit was better than all the blessings of God. And so he comes to tempt Jesus. But he waits. At least we assume that he waits. Some people look at this and say, no, throughout the 40 days and 40 nights that Jesus is fasting, Satan is there picking on him. But we know this. After 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus has been fasting and focusing his his effort on disciplining his body, that he is in control of himself, and that the appetites of his flesh do not control him. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you need to go 40 days and 40 nights without eating. You can tell by looking at me that I don't frequently go 40 days and 40 nights without eating. In fact, I've never gone that long. But I think there is something to the, the idea of that sometimes we let the appetites of our flesh rule over us, and I think that harms us spiritually. Whether it's our appetite for lunch, or appetite for other things that are pleasing. And we need to think about that. Jesus fasts from, from food for 40 days to prepare for what's coming. Most of us, if I were to say, hey, as a church, I think we should take, take this on. I think we should take a week that we as a church together fast and pray. All the effort, all the time, all the energy that we normally would put into food, let's put into reading the Bible and pray instead. And let's take a week and do that. Most of us, if we survived that week, would think that that week had been what we were working for and preparing for. Getting from that Sunday to the following Sunday. But really, Jesus fasts and prays to be ready for what comes at the end of it. We fast and pray it's to be ready for what comes at the end of it. At this point, what comes at the end of it is Satan shows up and says, Hey, you're hungry. Why don't you prove who you are? Demand these stones to become bread. Take what God's given you, take who you are, and use it for what you want. That's a fairly common temptation, if you think about it. Get what you want. Get it right now. Serve the needs of the body. You're hungry, right? Jesus says, no. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It doesn't mean that if you don't have food, you can always just read your Bible and be happy. Nor does this actually mean that it's like the, uh, and, and this is in the, the insert that was in your bulletin this morning. I know it said December on it, but it was still had some, some cute things in it, including the statement that if you ever, if, if you need a vehicle in case you get trapped out in the wilderness, the Land Rover is the way to go. The instruction manual for the landowner, Land Rover, 
The owner's manual, the front half is about your vehicle, the back half is survival tactics. And the entire owner's manual is printed on edible paper. Has the caloric and nutritional value of two cheeseburgers. So that if you're ever trapped out in the wilderness in your Land Rover, you can read the manual, see what it says to do about survival, and you can eat it if you have to. You think that that's, you, you think I'm, I'm not making this stuff up? That's not what Jesus means. It's not what the text means when it says that we should live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It doesn't mean go eat your Bible if you get hungry. It means that, that more important than just food is obedience to what God has said. And Jesus knows doing what Satan says is doing the opposite. And when we face temptation, we need to realize that oftentimes it is a temptation to meet what looks like a need and the desire that we have right then. And the response to it is to come back to the text and say, does what God say, says override his desire? Does God not promise a better way? Satan tempts him again this time by misusing and misquoting scripture to him. He gives him the exact quote, hey, up, the angels will protect you. Go ahead, go out there and be stupid. Do something goofy. After all, if God has a plan for your life, He won't let your goof, your your stupidity get you hurt. Jesus says, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Folks, it's important that we do this, and that is we study and understand the Word of God and what God means by it. There are a lot of people out there that can pull one line out of Scripture and say, well, the Bible says this. And then we say, well, you know, you need to actually look at what it means. And they say, oh, no, no, you're just trying to look for the loophole. Well, sometimes that's what we're doing, and we shouldn't do that. Sometimes we need to look at it and see what it actually, what it actually means. When the Lord says, if your right eye causes you to sin, you should pluck it out, does that mean that if you are tempted to look at things you shouldn't look at, that you should actually go home and find yourself a nice sharp screwdriver and take it out? I would tell you that no, that's not actually what is intended by that. What's intended by that is that we spend a whole lot of time and effort trying to preserve things that are temporary, and trying to protect ourselves when in fact we should be much more worried about obedience. Otherwise we'd all be walking around blind and disfigured because every one of us has sinned before with our eyes and every one of us has sinned before with our hands. And if we misapply that scripture, we'd have to take it out of our eyes and take it off our hands for it. We do not need to let Satan tempt us into taking the Bible the wrong way. There's plenty of people that do that. There are plenty of people that take where God speaks of righteousness and they apply it badly. And they see themselves as responsible for enforcing God's law when in fact God is perfectly capable of dealing with certain things and certain people in all the ways that he sees best fit. Jesus is both faithful and merciful. He'll deal with us righteously, and he'll deal with us in his mercy. The devil takes him up to a very high kingdom and offers him something that doesn't belong to Satan. He says, I'll give you the whole world if you'll just worship me. Folks, this is the essence of temptation. The devil offers you something that's not his to give, if you'll give him something that's not his to ask for. All the kingdoms of this world have never belonged to Satan. There may be some people that have tried to rule them in his behalf. I think that if you were to take a history book off the shelf and flip through it, you could find example after example after example of the actions of people that show that they were allowing Satan to, to rule through them, but those kingdoms never did belong to Satan. 
even under the Emperor Nero, who burned half the city, well, not half the city of Rome, approximately 30% of the city of Rome, was going to build itself a nice little palace on the rail road. Even under him, the Apostle Paul says, God has appointed the rulers of this world to be his instrument. Even as the Babylonians and and the Assyrians conquered their ways across the ancient Near East, stacked up piles of skulls outside of conquered cities as a warning to anybody else that would resist. God say, these are my instrument for my judgment. All the kingdoms of this world belong to the Lord God Almighty and weren't safe to offer. He'll offer what he cannot, what is not his to give, if you'll give him what is not his to claim. He'll offer you perfect peace if you'll just give him your worship, but he can't give you peace. He'll offer you all the money that you can stand if you'll just give him your efforts. He'll offer you all the pleasures you can handle if you'll just hand your marriage over to him. It's not his to give. Those things belong to the Lord God. Give to him that which is your, that which is his. So how do we fight it? Well, I'll tell you this. Jesus is the one through whom the world was made and who will bring judgment on the world, who will cleanse it by fire, who at a single word could strike Satan out of existence. You read the back of the book of Revelation and you see the rider on the white horse with the sword coming from his mouth, which is the word, is the one who defeats the beast, the armies of the beast, the angels of the beast, and the other beast, and the dragon, all of those things that we read in the book of Revelation and we spend hours upon hours trying to figure out what they are and what those stand for and when they're coming and whether it's this person or whether it's that person. You know, and it's the beast with the five heads and the ten horns and all of this. Is that the, you know, is the United Nations, is the Federal Reserve Bank, is it Visa? Yes, I've heard that act. That, that plane, it's the banks. You could probably make the argument, I think if you tried hard enough, I could argue, we could try to find in Scripture that that the five heads of the beast are the National Football League, the National Basketball Association, Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, and the NCAA, as far as the the, the collegiate sports. You know, it's the the five temptations that men fall into in America. It's one of those sports somewhere along the way. Maybe NASCAR is at fault here. It's hard to say. All of these things are, could it be this or could it be that? And really the identity that we need to worry about in the book of Revelation is this, the rider on the white horse. Because he's the one who wins. The one who is faithful and true. The one who causes the beast and the false prophet and all of those to be bound and thrown into the pit. The one who is worthy to open the seals. You read the book of Revelation trying to sort out what everything else is about. And the most important things in Revelation are abundantly clear. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. All of the power and all of that. And how does Jesus fight the temptation that Satan throws at him? With the book of Deuteronomy. From this. by reminding Satan of what God has already said. By reminding Satan of the eternal truth of the Word of God. That these things are true. Folks, if we want to talk about spiritual battles and spiritual difficulties and fighting temptation, the thing that we have to understand is that if we don't start here with knowing and understanding the Word, Committing it to our hearts the best that we can. And we're walking out to do battle. And leaving the one weapon that we have on the shelf. Most of you have been in church long enough, you're familiar with the, the passage where Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God and you're but it's worth remembering. 
Well, yes, you can club somebody with your shield of faith. The only thing that is in that list that amounts to a weapon that is able to go out away from you and make a difference in the field of battle is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And whether the battle is coming to you in the form of temptation or you are going out in the effort to go and spread the gospel and spread the word and share what Christ has done for people, what you have is the word. Rightly sharpened, rightly understood, rightly brought into your heart, rightly a part of who you are. Not blunted by your actions the day before. But sharpened by your life. Not used clumsily, but used with wisdom and with understanding. Not something that you have to grow up around for. You never see, if you ever watch movies about ancient Roman warfare and even you know, medieval warfare, when they go and they go to draw their swords. You always know the guy's going to lose when he goes looking for it and he doesn't know where it is. You, know, you never see in that big climactic sword fight at the end of the movie, you never see the, the, the great warrior going, well, where did I put it? Is, it, is it here, is it there, where did I leave it? You see him draw it, he knows where it is. He's got it handy. Folks, if the Word of God is scattered among all the other things that you know and it doesn't enjoy a place of prominence in your life where you know where to find it, you're starting from behind. You're starting a lap down or a touchdown behind or you're starting off with, a, with an unpreheated oven and a case of empty bottles. There we go. That hits everybody, right? We've got sports, we've got cooking, we've got sewing. What else do we need? Flat tires? With all your sockets out of order and they're not in the right place in your toolbox. Your arrows are in the case in the truck. And there's that beater right there. You're just not ready. And danger will overtake you. And temptation will overtake you. And it may be that you're able to flee and not fall to it, but you will not be victorious without the Word. If we don't study it, and we don't learn it, and we don't do the best that we can to put it in our heads. And you say, well, I can't memorize like, I, like I'd like to. I understand that. I would challenge you to actually try. Pick a verse. Write it down. Write it down every day for a week. Say it out loud while you write it down. That people will laugh at you while you do it, but that'll be okay. They'll be hearing you read the Word. Pick one verse and try that. And you may not get it memorized word for word when you do that, but I guarantee you, you'll get the idea in your head better than if you don't try. Read the Word. Study the Word. Understand the Word. Because otherwise, temptation, when it gets to you, will win. We have an enemy who is out there to get us. He's got his minions, he's got the people on his side, and they're out to destroy God's people. And if we don't arm ourselves by studying and knowing what God's given us, we'll fall. We don't want to do that. Not as individual people and not as a church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your word. We pray, Lord God, that you'll help us to take your word into our hearts or to arm ourselves against temptation to it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We come with a time in our service that we call our hymn of response or hymn of invitation. And you all know what we'll do in this time. I'll be standing here at the front. I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you. Barry will come and lead us as we sing. Barry, number four, four, thank you.